Hi everyone, welcome to Fawcett Molecular Machines Group. I'm really happy to have a previous Fawcett Fellow, Julio Ragason, here from the University of Strasbourg, and he'll be presenting on driven chemical processes here. Thank you so much for joining. You're one of our last seminars in the year, so I'm feeling a little bit festive already. Really, really excited for your talk. And yeah, I'll be in the chat. I'll share info about you in the chat here for everyone who's here. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to already ask them in the chat or afterwards use hand raise feature. And thank you so much for coming to you. The stage is yours and I'll be looking about in the chat. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to the Foresight Institute for giving me the opportunity to share uh, what has been happening in the last few years. And thanks also for the people who are attending in this, in this moment for dedicating a little bit of time to, to this. So we discuss how it's possible to use molecular machines for purposes different from motion. And actually, this talk revolves around uh, uh, one concept, uh, which is the concept of uh, uh, molecular ratchets. And to use the words of Peter Hoffman, a physicist, uh, life ratchets, these mechanisms are how molecular machines extract order from chaos. What is the meaning uh, of this uh, sentence? So I will write there bit by bit starting from what is a macroscopic ratchet. A macroscopic ratchet is a mechanism, an object that rectifies macroscopic motion. I'm showing this, this object here where there is a ratchet and a pole. And when a ball bounces on one side, this bar, then we can have rotation in one direction. When uh, the ball bounces on the opposite side of this bar, there cannot be um, unidirectional uh, rotation. And actually, the, the person who popularized this mechanism in the realm of science was Feynman, who noted that if we just shrink down this mechanism, then it's not possible anymore to have uh, directionality uh, with using the same principles, because the shape of the barrier of the ratchet doesn't matter anymore. It is the height of the barrier which matters. But I don't think that we should really throw everything away from, from macroscopic, let's say, objects. And the one example that I use from, from Daniel Dime is the following. So here you're looking at a loudspeaker, and there is this little box with two different compartments. And so what happens is that when the loudspeaker bounces up and down, the balls, they can also bounce from one side to the other. And after some time, they accumulate in one uh, compartment. So of course, here there is some friction in, involved, so this is not something that we find at the molecular level. But I think a key concept is that there is an asymmetry in, in energy consumption. And this is something that we also find at the molecular level. So what is a molecular ratchet then? I would say that it's a mechanism that couples an energy source to an unfavorable process. For example, in this case, this monomer, they can assemble and form a high energy state. If we have some energy that uh, manages to create this high energy state. This cannot happen through the regular path that was already there. There should be a different path, and therefore we end up with a reaction cycle, which is something that we will find in multiple instances in this in this talk. Actually, these ideas have been developed in the con in the domain of uh, molecular motion. And I should say that uh, the theory has been really developed by essentially by Dean Stumian, who actually I saw here in, in the audience. So he's the real expert of these of these mechanisms. And for the molecular realization, the groups of Lee, Feringa, and Storder developed uh, amazing science. Of course, I will use the, the examples from what what my group and my, myself and, and the group where I studied have contributed. But uh, these are really the main, the main players. Please refer to, to their chemistry if uh, you're interested in this aspect. In general, there are uh, two types, uh, two families of molecular ratchets. It can be energy ratchet and information ratchet. As a rule of thumb, in energy ratchet, thermodynamics uh, rules. And in most cases, this implies alternating condition. In the case of, of information ratchet mechanism, it is kinetics uh, which rules. And actually here, the distinction is quite significant, I think, because in one case, it's the stability of intermediates that matters. In the other case, the case of information ratchet, is the energy of transition states which rules. So we'll describe two examples, one, one each, starting from energy ratchets, and in particular, a system that we have studied in our group, but is clearly inspired by a beautiful, more elaborated example developed in the Lee group. So this rotaxin, or actually maybe pseudo-rotaxin in this case, is composed by 
an action, which has a primary uh, an amine, which is a weak recognition site for this macrocycle, and a triazolium, which is also a weak recognition site for this macrocycle. So if you just mix these two molecules in acetonitrile, these states are mostly populated. Whereas accumulating this uh, state at conditions that are uh, not compatible with equilibrium would mean accumulating a uh, high energy state, meaning that we have a higher population of this particular state. The strategy that we can use to accumulate this target high energy state is first adding uh, an acid and then adding a base. So when we add uh, an acid, this hydrogen bond here becomes dynamic. Uh, we lose for a moment these sterically units, the ring can thread. And here we also form an ammonium ion, which is a very good station for the macrocycle. The bottom equilibrium of this reaction is shifted very much towards the assembled state. But when we add a base, the system reverts to the top states. And actually, we go back to the amine, but the ring relocates on the triazolium. So the scientific question that we wanted to address with this uh, system, where both uh, thermodynamic kinetic feature needs to be switched, was how much energy remains stored in this high energy state. So usually this is associated with, with motion, but can we say something about the energy of this, of accumulating this state? So the general idea was that since the de-threading rate is controlled by this hydrogen, in this case, Modulating the substituent on the hydrogen would have made it possible to observe the dithreading kinetics on a time scale appropriate to perform calorimetry experiments so that to measure the heat exchanged in the relaxation and to have an idea of the uh, component associated uh, component of energy associated to heat. Actually, when we started to investigate different, different hydrazides, we bumped immediately into what is called all or nothing substituent effect, which was something that was noted by Stoddard and his collaborators well, more than 20 years ago, which is the fact that with the crown eaters, essentially either the ring de-threads very fast or it remains trapped for a very long time. De-threading very fast implies that when we perform an enema, the ring has detreaded before even recording the first NMR. Long time might mean a few days before detreading. So we tested several hydrazides and we tried to rationalize our observation using sterimal parameters. So for example, parameter L indicates the length of a given substituent and parameter B5, that's the nomenclature of these static parameters, indicates the uh, longest, the shortest, dis the longest distance uh, that is perpendicular to the direction of parameter L. We can plot uh, each hydrazide in a graph that is constructed by having on one axis the parameter L and in on one axis the parameter B5. There is a W before these parameters because they are wa weighted for the Boltzmann population of the different conformation of this hydrazide. In this particular case, the hydrazide that you see on the screen has this particular combination of B5 and L parameters. If we add all the other hydrazides that we tested under the same condition, what we can observe is that the hydrazides that are blocked, the, the thread to slow, are on the periphery of this graph. So essentially, we need the combination of large B5 and large L to block the system. What caught our attention is the fact that isopropyl substituted hydrogen, they fall in both categories. So there, are, there is the ortho substituted uh, isopropyl substituted hydrazide, which is blocked. Uh, the meta defreads very fast, and the para defreads fast, but is very close to another derivative which remains blocked. We reconsidered the situation that we were analyzing, and we thought that the triazolium and crown eater they interact via hydrogen bond. And therefore, if uh, we could use a solvent that is less competitive for hydrogen bonding interaction, then we would stabilize a little bit uh, the high energy state without probably affecting too much uh, the, st the threading barrier, which is controlled by steric reason, uh, most likely. And indeed, by using a mixed uh, solvent st system, it was possible to observe uh, at the NMR a threading kinetic, and we, we obtain a threading constant uh, that is reported on the screen. Actually, the time scale of this uh, NMR experiment, a few minutes, is compatible with the time scales that we can observe in using calorimetry. And indeed, the next experiment was uh, calorimetry one. So we assembled the system under a CD condition where the assembled state is more thermodynamically stable. And then a base was added. 
what we recorded in terms of heat exchange is, is what you can see here on the screen. First, we have a release uh, of heat, and then we have a little component of heat absorption. So to give a meaning to this observation, we performed a control experiment with the same component, but they were not assembled. So we still have the acid-base reaction, but we do not have any threading or de-threading reaction. So in this case, we see again the component of heat that is released, but we do not see the component of heat uh, that is absorbed. And now from this graph, it seems a very um, minor difference, essentially. But if we simply zoom in into the heat uh, absorption, then we can of observe a very nice de-threading kinetics. And the moment when we convinced ourselves that we were really looking into this uh, de-threading process is when we could fit the calorimetry data using the de-threading rate determined in the NMR experiment. And, and you can trust me that if we use 5 or 10% more, 5 or 10% less, for this value, the fitting doesn't work anymore. So we have a process that absorbs heat on a time scale that is perfectly matching the one of the de-threading process. So what is the meaning of this, of the delta H that we measure, this 20 kilojoule per mole? Actually, one comparison is with instantaneous cold packs. Actually, in fact, the stored entropy, this value that we measure is comparable to what is found is in the instantaneous cold packs. For the first time that we looked into an energetic property and we don't focus on, on motion, actually, we found a value that is comparable with something that we use, hopefully, in, not in our daily life, because sometimes it means we are we hurt ourselves if we need an instantaneous ice package. Uh, but actually, so these values are very much compatible with something that we, we are familiar with. Okay, so this is an example of energy ratchet. We have alternated conditions and, um, and thermodynamics converse the behavior of the system. Now we move to one example of information ratchet uh, mechanism. And actually, information ratchet mechanisms, they are key in nature. They are at the basis of conformation changes. This is uh, how molecular machines operate, our muscles, that's why I can speak. Adaptation, so cytoskeleton exploits an information ratchet. The assembly of microtubules is associated with this type of mechanism. And even energy transduction is a process that is associated with an information ratchet uh, mechanism. In all these cases, they are enabled by a couple catalytic process. So the structure that you see on the on this slide, actually, they are for, in this case, the hydrolysis uh, of uh, small molecules. And while they catalyze uh, other reaction, they perform the particular task, conformation changes, adaptation, transduction. How can we leverage uh, catalysis? It would be easy to say that we need to add uh, some sort of chemical fuel uh, to, to the system, but this is not sufficient. And actually, um, apart from uh, the important series of work of Tina Stumian. Uh, a significant comment was provided by uh, Donna Blackmond a few years ago when uh, she uh, brought in Angevante that if we don't consider all the aspects carefully, it may seem as if uh, pigs uh, were flying. So I will try to guide you through the example of how to leverage catalysis to assemble a high energy uh, state. And in particular here, I have the connection with microtubules but I'm well aware that the chemistry of microtubules is much more complicated than what I will discuss. And some uh, biologists, they prefer the parallel with, with actin. Uh, what I can reassure you of is that uh, all the elements that I will describe, they are also present in the assembly of, uh, of microtubules. So there is this parallel to connect with biology, but of course, what I will say is not, is not at all um, a comprehensive description of microtubules, which are much more complicated, but that's one way to convey the essence of this information ratchet mechanism associated with an assembly reaction, self assembly reaction. Microtubules are formed by GDP rich tubulin dimers, but the thermodynamic equilibrium is shifted completely towards the monomeric state. What happens is that GTP replaces a GDP and forms uh, a dimer, which is now thermodynamically prone to self assembly. In the assembled state, we have the hydrolysis of the phosphate, which affords the high energy state. Here we have a chemical reaction cycle, and the slowest step of the chemical reaction cycle is microtubule disassembly. Therefore, what we have is a reaction cycle with accumulation just before the slowest step. If we consider the sequence of the three green reactions, what we have is that we have the hydrolysis of GTP, our fuel, that is now coupled with an assembly process. So these two reactions, they happen together in a stepwise manner, but they are coupled. So tubulin dimers, they catalyze GTP hydrolysis, but they need to assemble to do. 
The reason why it, it's difficult to realize something like this in an artificial system is that in the very same chemical reaction network, what can also happen, and here nature is uh, amazing in avoiding this, is that we can have uh, GTP binding to the assembled state and then disassembly and hydrolysis in the monomeric state. So we, have, we can have the sequence of these three uh, gray reactions. In this case, when we look at uh, the sum of these three gray reactions, again, we have the hydrolysis of GDP. But in this case, this is coupled with the disassembly process. Both these processes are thermodynamically allowed and kinetics rules and dictates which one of the two will prevail. So there is, needs to be some sort of kinetic asymmetry, which is a term that they states back to the late 80s, actually before I was born, and uh, has been really uh, explored extensively uh, by Dina Stumian and, and then uh, several chemists, and I mentioned before, the groups of Lee, uh, Feringa, and Stoddart, who experimentally implement these ideas. I want to reinforce the cause that we need some sort of kinetic asymmetry by showing you some kinetic simulations on the same system that I showed you before, First, on a kinetically symmetric system, with a system where there is no kinetic preference for the green or the gray uh, reaction sequence. We can imagine of enclosing everything uh, in a box, providing the substrate, removing the product. And in this talk, I'm using interchangeably fuel and substrate or waste and product. They have the same meaning in this, in this particular case. And what we do now is that we look at the steady state concentration under continuous turnover of, of substrate. So the larger the circle that you see on the screen, the more a given state uh, is populated. So in this case, for example, the thermodynamically stable microtools are the most populated state. Then we ask ourselves whether this self-assembly reaction and this self-assembly reaction are at equilibrium or not. This is a kinetic simulation, so it's easy. We can just remove all the interaction uh, with the substrate and product, and we let these two equilibria relax. What we find is that we have exactly the same concentration, meaning that the equilibrium concentration are exactly the same as those under continuous fuel consumption. Therefore, fuel consumption does not affect self-assembly equilibria. If instead we perform exactly the same sequence of, let's say, of steps, on a system that is kinetically asymmetric, which means that the transition state for this step and the transition state for this green step have been lowered, but thermodynamics is exactly the same, then what we observe is different. So when we provide substrate and remove uh, the waste product, and we observe the steady state concentration, we immediately observe that the high energy state, our target state, is now the most populated. We can confirm that this is a non-equilibrium system in the sense that the self-assembly um, reactions are away from equilibrium by removing all the interaction with substrate and product and letting the system relax to equilibrium. So here, the key message is that kinetic asymmetry allows a driven self-assembly, so self away from equilibrium. And to fix uh, the ideas, you can uh, have a look at this animation uh, where you can see a substrate that binds preferentially to the monomeric state and is released preferentially in the assembled states. This is a type of kinetic asymmetry that allows some of the energy that is, that is in the substrate, and let's say in a population of substrates, in fact, to be transferred to the catalyst. They are actually assembled into a high energy state. And in fact, actually, is the population what is really important. Okay, so we have seen these two examples of energy and information ratchet. The situation is not always so clearly defined. So we can have also intermediate state. And actually, this is how I got interested in the topic and when I was studying a molecular pump. So this is a system where we have a molecular axle that incorporates these azobenzene units, photoactive. And from the previous example, now you know that this uh, ammonium ion is a good station for a macro cycle like this. In fact, the ring is emissive, but the emission is quenched in the assembled state by an energy transfer process. And this is how we can monitor the system by looking at its uh, luminescence. We can also use light to isomerize the system. So in the trans state, threading happens preferentially through the azobenzene unit, whereas threading through the cyclopentyl is a slower process. But if we isomerize azobenzene, which we invert uh, the threading and the threading side, now it's quicker to thread through the cyclopentyl unit, and it's much slower to thread through the cis-azobenzene. And the system is also uh, less stable. 
So we can picture what is uh, happening uh, by looking at this animation. So we can have threading in the when the azobenzene is in the trans state. Then isomerization destabilizes the, destabilizes the system, and we have detrain through the opposite side. In this, thanks to this sequence of processes, we have the unidirectional transit of the of the macrocycle through the axon through the axon. We proved experimentally that photo switching to benzene changes the stability of, of the complex. And indeed, uh, what you are looking at here is a titration where the trans complex is a little bit more stable than the cis complex. And we compared the um, threading rates of the asymmetric axon with symmetric axons. From these three kinetics, you can see that uh, threading of the symmetric axon with two trans azobenzene is much faster than the one with two cyclopentyl units, and then uh, the same axon becomes much slower than the one with two azobenzene when the azobenzines are in the cis uh, uh, isomer. When we compare this with the asymmetric axon, the asymmetric axon in its trans isomer threads essentially as fast as the double axon in the trans isomer. But then when we photoisomerize to cis, the thread is much slower and becomes comparable with the one of the symmetric axon with two uh, cyclopentyls. And actually here, this value of 1.1 is really perfect because here we have one chance of threading through the cyclopentyl unit, and here we have two statistically. And therefore, it, it matches perfectly the fact that here the rate comes to this point as twice as much. So I was I wanted initially to perform this experiment stepwise. So first I assembled the system in its trans isomer, then irradiated to form the cis one. And I was hoping to observe a de-threading process, but I never observed this process actually. And the reason is that the thermal isomerization was faster than the threading. So the stepwise cycle is not practical. But at the time when we were facing this problem, we realized that our system had two thermal and two photochemical steps in the same way as the Ferringham motor has. This is a famous unidirectional rotary motor that led to the Nobel Prize of Ben Ferringham in 2016. We tried then to break detailed balance under illumination, so to keep light on and to have the unidirectional occurrence of this chemical reaction cycle. So in the next few minutes, I will try to explain uh, why this is indeed uh, happening, what we should expect to observe, and how we could prove that this is really happening. So starting from a very general uh, scheme, what breaks detailed balance? So if we have four states with the equilibrium constant equal to one, then for sure the system will reach equilibrium at some point. <coughs> But if one of these uh, states is light driven, then uh, we still have a constraint. And for example, we need to have a given ratio between this um, blue pentagon and this uh, uh, green oval, which is determined by the photostationary state of uh, the equilibrium reaction. And there is no reason why this should be one. Maybe it will be two, this ratio. And therefore, this will lead to unidirectional cycle. So when symmetry is broken, and energy is needed for that, a cycling stationary state is reached in simple network. What breaks detailed balance in this particular network? We have a difference in stability constant. This has to be associated to an energy ratchet effect. And we have a difference in photostationary state. This We associate this with an information ratchet effect. At the molecular level, most likely, stack and interaction are at the base of this effect because we see from different experimental uh, data that there is an interaction between the azobenzene and the aromatic units of, of the ring. What we should be expect from a system like this to address this question is just in one more element, which is the fact that uh, the bottom reaction is the slowest step, step of the cycle. And therefore, expecting accumulation before the slowest step, we expect to have an accumulation of this particular state. And thus, a decrease in free ring concentration is expected at the photostationary state because more rings accumulate in this particular state. How could we prove that this is really happening? So our tool is fluorescence spectroscopy. So if we just mix uh, this macrocycle and this action in solution, we will have a given level of, of emission intensity at the equilibrium. So there will be a little bit of free ring, which is the only emissive species in solution. And uh, to this amount of free ring, uh, it will correspond a, a, a given level of emission intensity. If the azobenzene is converted to the cis uh, isomer, we will have a higher emission intensity because the system is less stable. Therefore, there will be more uh, free ring in solution and a higher level of emission intensity. The experiment that we did 
started from the system that is assembled in the trans uh, isomer at equilibrium. Then light is turned on. For what I mentioned before, we expect a decrease in free ring concentration. But then, if we turn light off, then we expect an increase in free ring concentration. And actually, the real experiment that we have done looked at this particular part of uh, this broader picture. Let's keep it in the corner. The system is assembled uh, in the dark. In its turn. Then we turn light on, and what we observe is a decrease in emission intensity. And then when light is turned off, we have an increase in emission intensity. If we perform exactly the same experiment, but with a system that is deprotonated, so optically is, is identical, and also the photochemistry is essentially identical, but we do not see any change in uh, the emission intensity. And because we knew all the rate constant of the system, then we can also uh, simulate what we observe under the irradiation, and the simulation uh, matches uh, pretty nicely or at least, let's say fairly nicely the experimental data. Overall, here what we demonstrated at the time is the operation of autonomous operation of molecular pump, but also actually an example of light-driven self-assembly because uh, here what we, is happening is a small effect, but we are accumulating a little bit of uh, three rings at concentration that are not compatible with equilibrium. Okay, so far I added a third example. We discussed energy run and an example of energy ratchet, an example of information ratchet, purely theoretical in this case. And then we have a mixed uh, example of energy and information rates. But we can also imagine of categorizing the system by the energy that they use. So we can have light as an energy source. We can chemicals as energy source that autonomously drive systems away from equilibrium. The question we tried to address recently was whether we could use electricity to drive systems away from equilibrium. And we started to, from the very simplest system that we could think of. It was a simple host gas system that was studied previously in, uh, in our lab. So here we have um, a calyx and we have a virogen derivative. And it's well known that in a polar solvent, such as acetonide or the chloromethane, this host and guest can assemble with the binding constant about 10 to the 6. I will show here the cyclic voltammetry to discuss how the system responds to redox stimuli. And in fact, this is a simplified picture to make the following experiment uh, a bit more clear. Actually, the first process that we encounter when we perform a cyclic voltammetry is a reduction, and this is a reduction process of the assembled state. The system is stabilized and therefore reduces at, at more negative potential. This peak is uh, irreversible. So if for a reversible system, usually there is a peak here, which we don't, do not find in this case. And the reason why this peak is not observed is that the system de-threads, and therefore what is observed is the oxidation of the free virogen uh, species, which oxidizes and actually the free species also reduces at much less negative potentials. But this also illustrates that the system is redox responsive. And therefore, you now know that having chemical reaction cycle is key if we want to develop non-equilibrium systems of this type. And therefore, we can imagine of assembling the, um, the two species, forming the complex, reducing it, having a disassembly process, followed by another redox process, which, com which completes uh, the uh, chemical reaction cycle. How can we create a symmetry in this system? What we did was to in introduce an asymmetry in space by using a scanning electrochemical microscope setup. So this is a setup that allows to control two different uh, electrodes at the same time and imposing two different potential. This is uh, let's say this is, for example, not possible with the standard cyclic voltammetry setup. It is necessary a BP potentiometer, which is uh, common, but less common than uh, a typical cyclic voltammetric setup. And then uh, the advantage of using scan electron microscope is also that we can control precisely uh, the distance between the two electrons. What is the challenge uh, for really realizing uh, such chemical reaction network and driving it uh, and driving the self-assembly reactions away from equilibrium, which is our goal. Actually, the challenge is to avoid unproductive cycles. So, for example, if uh, the reduced complex diffuses immediately the opposite electrode, then this self-assembly reaction does not participate anymore in the sequence of steps that bring one electron from this electrode to the opposite electrode. And therefore, this self-assembly reaction would simply adjust to the concentration of these species. 
So the key is to demonstrate that this self-assembly step, this one in the reduced state and this in the, in the oxidized state, they participate to uh, the sequence of reactions that uh, shuttle electrons from one electrode to uh, the opposite one. Another unproductive cycle is the following. In this case, after oxidation, the, the biologen should not diffuse directly to the opposite electrode, rather it should first assemble. This is how we have demonstrated that uh, the system de-threads upon reduction before reaching the opposite electrode. We started by scan by keeping the substrate at a potential of minus 0.8 volt, which is a potential that uh, forms this reduced complex. Instead, we scanned uh, the potential of the tip. And what we observe is an oxidation current and the onset of this oxidation current is close to minus 0.3 volt, which is compatible with the oxidation of this uh, species. So if the, the reduced complex would arrive at the opposite electrode, we would observe an oxidation current also here, for example, at minus 0.5 uh, volts. And therefore, we can prove that this threading occurs faster than diffusion. Proving that assembly occurs faster than diffusion is more challenging because we are operating in a solution that is already rich in these two components. And therefore, this implies observing a newly formed complex at the tip in a situation where there are already many complexes like that in solution. So we implemented the two-step strategies with the control experiment. So first we used uh, an axle which has a very long alkyl chain. This long alkyl chain has slowed down a lot the threading and de-threading um, processes. So when we scan the substrate, what happens is that first we form the free species, the reduced ones, but then in the backward scan, we form again the oxidized species. The tip is kept at minus 0.6 volt. This is a potential at which we can reduce the free action, but we cannot reduce the complex. So if the threading is uh, slow, then what happens is that in what we record, so the gray part is not particularly interesting because it's the current that we record while the scan is being performed. But what is interesting is the backward part of the scan. So this is the flow and this is the, the backward. In particular, the one indicated in red. So here in the backward uh, part of the scan, we observe a reduction current, which is compatible with the reduction of the free axon. We have slow threading and therefore the free axon is reduced. If we perform exactly the same uh, experiment, but now with the axon that we used in our experiment, upon scanning and then um, keeping the tip at minus 0.6 volt, actually we do not observe in this case a, um, a reduction current. And this is compatible with the fact that we have the, the hypothesis that we have fast threading and therefore the axon is not reduced at the tip. This per se is a negative evidence, but uh, hopefully with the control experiment with a very slow threading, for us it was sufficiently convincing that our system is really operating in this way. And actually we know very well the system will have all the uh, diffusion constants and the redox potential and therefore we could simulate uh, what is happening in our uh, setup. And what you are looking at here is a graph of the dissipation. So this is the conversion of uh, energy into heat. And dissipation happens very close to the two uh, electrodes, essentially. So this, um, the system is close to equilibrium in the central part of the experimental setup. This uh, dissipation is the dissipation at the steady state. And at the steady state, the same amount of energy that is dissipated is also absorbed. So energy absorption and dissipation are equal. And for this reason, we can use the dissipated, dissipated energy as a proxy for the energy that is absorbed. And because we know how much energy input we have in the system, then we can, can, can calculate the energy efficiency, which is essentially the thermodynamic efficiency, so the efficiency at which energy is harvested from uh, the electrical force to maintain the self-assembly reactions away from equilibrium. What we found is that we have the highest efficiency reported to date for an autonomous system for which uh, a comparable analysis is available. And most likely this is related to the fact that uh, we are not using light, so we don't have a lot of excess energy. And we can also exploit essentially an energy ratchet effect and designing the stability of intermediates is much easier than designing transition state and probably that's why in the present moment, the efficiency of chemically driven systems that, that exploit information ratchet is, 
typically typically lower, but I'm sure there will be uh, fast progress uh, in the near future. Because this is a foreign side talk, I was asked to come up with a number of challenges, and I am very happy to to do that. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm junior PI. Let's say there are people who are much more qualified than, than myself to indicate the challenges uh, of the field. And actually, because the foreign side has a very broad audience, I also try to think very quite broadly, actually. And I think there are challenges that are uh, technical that would uh, help very much uh, the field. One, for example, is developing methods to monitor reaction fluxes rather than concentrations. So most of chemistry is done by monitoring reaction fluxes, monitoring concentrations. And from these, we derive the fluxes. But actually, there are very few techniques that can be helpful to monitor how often a given uh, reaction happens when the concentrations are not, are not changing. So new techniques would be a massive advantage. Another aspect that is related is developing methods to gain information on steps that are different from essentially the rate determining step. Because this also relates to some aspects I mentioned before. So we observe accumulation before the slowest step, and therefore we can say something about the slowest step, but it's much more difficult to say something about the other steps that are involved. So if there were techniques to gain information on steps that are different from the rate determining step, I think they would be uh, very useful across uh, different fields. So these are two aspects that uh, essentially they call for techniques that we do not have, but there are also new techniques that we have. And actually, I think uh, machine learning, the use of machine learning will have a large impact. I think these are techniques that we don't really know yet how to implement in this type of research. Uh, there are some examples. There are, there's a beautiful work of Jordi Bure, Policy Nature, this year, where essentially machine learning is used to, to classify catalytic mechanisms, but this is, I think that's an area where we will see developments. And then, okay, if these are challenges that are more, more technical in a way or related to techniques, but I think that uh, energy transduction is an area where we will see developments is now very challenging. So the goal would be to transduce energy. So not just absorbing energy from a source, but also transferring it to something else. I think this could have impacts in uh, diffused energy harvesting. So if we learn how to harvest energy and transduce it in a, in a diffused way, I think this could have a large impact. So there are, if you think of it, the areas of uh, technology and science where we are able to perform energy transduction process, such as, let's say, the use of uh, solar energy or uh, batteries, they have a massive impact in our society. And if we, we learn how to do this with, with chemical to chemical energy, I think this will have uh, broad impacts. But now it's very challenging. And the last point that I, I came up with is um, entering Pasteur's uh, quadrant. So this is a combination of research that is fundamental, but also can solve some concrete, uh, some concrete challenge. And I think the research that has been done uh, in, in recent years uh, in this area uh, is often exploratory, which is amazing, but I think uh, many more people will be uh, engaged if we will find uh, a way to, let's say, to connect with societal needs closer and engage with uh, with use-inspired uh, basic reasons. And my very humble opinion is that uh, probably it could be, at least for me, this is true for myself, I think that I don't know which are the problems to which we could, um, which could but I think Soon we will learn that there are some areas of technology where we can really uh, contribute uh, uh, actively. And actually, these are some challenges that popped into my mind, but I think there are um, a lot of opportunities working in this area. And there are people who are more qualified than, than myself to indicate some possible areas of development. So I wanted to show how these the topics that are discussed today can connect with a list of new classes of problems that were indicated by, by George Whitesides in 2015 in a very famous essay, which is titled Reinventing Chemistry. And actually here there is there's a long list and actually there are many areas to which learning how to drive climate processes away from equilibrium can contribute. And those in blue are just those that are related to the challenges that I mentioned before. So for example, uh, number 16 is related to analytical techniques or uh, number 10 relates to energy generation, use, storage, and conservation. But all the other points uh, that are indicated with the yellow dot, uh, uh, they have, I think, a very clear connection with, with some aspects that I, that I mentioned. This is to say that 
even though sometimes uh, the community is, is not so broad, if we compare, for example, to pair of skies or other uh, areas of technology, I think we can connect with uh, uh, very many different areas of science. So today I discussed uh, molecular rats for uh, endergonic processes, uh, looking besides molecular machines. And if you're interested in this topic, I remind, I, I, I point you at this uh, review uh, that we recently wrote, there is tutorial and introduces the topic. Today in particular, I discussed the self-assembly, energy storage and cooling, and uh, efficient energy conversion. These are some of the topics that my lab is, is approaching. We study driven chemical processes. We have uh, one research line on redox active uh, supermolecular materials and one on chemically driven uh, endergonic reactions. And our approach is those of uh, the physical organic chemistry of non equilibrium system. I would like to conclude acknowledging all the members of the team. This is the most recent uh, picture that, that we have from just a few weeks ago. Simone did the work on the um, non equilibrium taxon in particular. And then we have Shema Fabiana, Amad, Titipo Kaiwan, Katrina Haidang, and Heads, uh, Suleiman, and all the staff of ISIS, the collaborators for the work that I've shown today, Pinocchio, and uh, we also collaborated with Mr. Bessato in Garten. And the analysis on the assembly was done in together with uh, Leonard Prince, whereas the work on the light driven pump was done when I was a PhD in the lab of Alberto Crane. Thank you very much uh, for uh, attending and for your time, and happy to uh, answer uh, any question you may have. Wow, amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was this was a lot. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping that I can share a little bit more about some of the work that you at least mentioned here in the chat. But if you can find it handy, feel free to do so too. Also, maybe as a first one, I would love to get to Dean immediately. Dean, if you've had uh, your question already in the chat uh, and you've had your hand raised uh, already since uh, quite some time. So just a reminder, if you want to ask any questions, just raise your hand uh, or pop your question in the chat if you can't speak. And then we'll get to it. So, Dean, you're first. Thank you. So, hi, Julio. Hello. Uh, hi, Dean. Thank is you. the fact that you have a tip electrode and a plane electrode essential for generating the directional motion of the fluxes? Or would it work as well with two plane electrodes? So, the short answer is yes. It would also work with two planar electrodes. Yeah. This is less common experimentally, let's say. And also... We also need to be a little bit careful because when we have planar electrodes, sometimes we can also have local changes in uh, the density, and this could give rise to convection. Yeah, general uh, the specific answer is yes, it's possible. Uh, experimentally, is a little bit more challenging, probably, or one would in have to include other ways of uh, migration and or mass transfer. Let's say one one other question while I have you. Yeah. You showed the situation with the light driven pump where you had an equilibrium constants of one for all four steps, and then suggested that by shining light, you could break that symmetry. And then in a particular condition, it's possible to break that symmetry, yes. So it's, let's say it's not always, uh, one should be careful in which, let's say, which photospecial states are in, but it's, let's say we can also say that when, if light, if we shine light on a system that has a photo switch and a, a, a square reaction network, for example, it's it's very rare that uh, we don't have some kind of asymmetry. Actually, we looked into recently. We looked into that in more details, and essentially, we found only one example where probably that this doesn't change um, the system. But yeah, and so very often that's the case. Very often you introduce an asymmetry in that, that way. Yeah, and it's just that my concern is that if you have that striking symmetry of equilibrium constants of one. If you could break it with light, you would not need three states to generate a laser. And we know, of course, you do. And yes. so by plugging in the Einstein relations, so basically, if you shine very bright light on a photochemically active system, you will bring the concentrations closer to equal. Yes and no. Actually, yes, if you take a molecule and it's excited state, we go precisely in the situation that you are, I think you're referring now. And uh, that's exactly, and it's true, absolutely true what you say. So I agree completely. In this case, uh, uh, what we are comparing are two ground states. Basically, yeah, the, the dominant process becomes uh, different when we have low light intensities. And essentially, we can forget about the uh, the excited state. So I'm comparing ele electronically ground states. So you're saying you can that if you have two systems that have identical concentrations, 
at equilibrium, that you can make it a situation where you have different concentrations in a photo illuminated uh, when, when there's photo illumination. So we should write down the network uh, precisely because so if we compare the ground states and the corresponding excited state, yeah. and then in the bright limit, no, I don't think uh, it would it would work. It's also true that we need to shine a huge amount of light to go in the, yeah. the condition under which most of the experimental chemistry is done. Actually, is a condition where essentially only the ground states uh, matter, and therefore you can change the population. This yes, you can do. Is if you take the simple azobenzene. The cis azobenzene has a higher energy. These are two states that are both electronically a ground state. Yeah. And with light, you can populate more the cis uh, uh, azobenzene, which is higher in energy, but it's not right, an right. excited state. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the normal circumstance. If you have two states, one of which is higher in energy than the other, and you mm-hmm. shine light, you get more of the higher energy state because that would bring it closer to equal distributions. Um, so um, I don't think you can ever, I don't know that you can ever go beyond 50 50. Actually, so with the simple azobenzene exists with a different variety of stabilities. And uh, yeah, there are some cases where you can go in one direction or the other. And But uh, the, uh, it's important to know, it's very important at this point that, for example, in some of your works, you discuss the electronically excited state. And, and what you're mentioning is perfectly correct. I agree when considering those those excited states. But essentially, in when we have just a very low amount of, or let's say moderate amount of light, then uh, encryption is very, is very different. So, so there are almost any, I would say, almost any, uh, let's say, stationary state. This, or do you want to respond to this? What's that? Uh, yeah. All right. My question is, I, I see a Well, person. I was just want, giving you... Yeah, so there is a person in the uh, chat. Uh, there's ask, another... Uh, yeah, uh, Mohammed, uh, you can either uh, unmute or I can just ask. Mohammed want to know how we can use computational chemistry methods to investigate more of your area. And I know that we already discussed this uh, a little bit, but if you want to dive a bit more deeper into yeah, thank you so much for asking. Okay, so thank you, thank you, Mohammed, for your question. There are different types of approaches that one can use with, with computational chemistry. I think that uh, an area that has that, it, that can develop a lot is the computation of uh, uh, transition states, because essentially computing ground states. This is what people usually start with with computational chemistry, and there are a lot of methods to do that. Calculating transition states is more challenging, and so when developing information asset mechanism, essentially is all about uh, realizing different transition states. So I think there's really a lot of computational chemistry that can be that can contribute in that particular area. And then in this in this domain, there is also a lot of let's say kinetic modeling and anticipation and, and prediction. And there are a lot of uh, related areas. Uh, it, in these days, I have in my mind microparticles that move because there was a very nice article uh, out in these days on this topic. But there are different areas of computational chemistry that can uh, that contribute actually already to this area. Awesome. Wonderful. We still have three minutes or so, so maybe I can ask one question that I think people usually in this group are quite interested in. Is like you you laid out a few of the open challenges that you would be interested in other people taking on. And thanks for that. Thanks for being so uh, precise about them. That was really useful. And what's up next for you and, and your team? What are you going to tackle next? Like perhaps like in the next few months or in the next year, like what kind of collaborations are you hoping to engage in? And then how can others potentially help support your work or engage with your work or collaborate with your work? Actually, so in this moment, we, in, in one case, we are trying to use this mechanism to assemble uh, a material. And actually, we are uh, using, let's say, established uh, motifs using redox chemistry. But I think as a lab, we interact more and more with, hopefully, with, with the material scientists. And then we are also trying to understand how we can use chemical energy to drive reactions away from equilibrium. This is very challenging. There are just a few essentially types of molecules that can be used. And, and the third topic I would say is essentially is uh, spatial differentiation. So we have seen the last example where we had two electrodes. I think there are a number of yeah of things that we could we could do in that in that area. And for example. Recently, we are also exploring with the help also of Dina Stumin and Emanuele Tenocchio the, the theoretical basis of this. Okay, awesome. Is there anything that you wish we had talked about that we didn't have time for in the final minute before we close it out? 
Any final bits that you want people to know? I think actually the last thing maybe is that I'm very optimistic about the development of, of the field because I think that there are a lot of areas to which we can contribute. So I really see a lot of potentials for developments in areas that now are essentially very different from where the field has, has come from. So I'm very much looking forward to the developments of, of the field and the branches that will that we'll develop. And I think as a young lab, we'll, we'll also, let's say, Hopefully we will find, now we are exploring different aspects, but I think at some point we will, we will identify one challenge and, and go for it, let's say, with all our energies, let's say. Yeah, I love that laundry list. I think that more labs should be asking, asking themselves which of these challenges they are applicable to. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Thanks everyone for coming and for your great questions. Congratulations on such fantastic research. And I hope to see all of you probably in the next year, if not in the next few weeks. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, that was really fantastic. And the video will be online very soon. Bye, everyone.